Somehow it made him less nervous to have the thing where he could see it. He hoped he wasn't losing his mind. He was under an unthinkable amount of stress, of course, but he needed to keep it together for Tyler. Rest. Detective Ramirez told him to get some rest. Instead of going back to the couch, Robert walked down the hallway to his bedroom, carrying the bear. He set the bear down on the bed. Looking at it, he felt a, such a surge of hate for the toy that his stomach roiled. He ran to the bathroom and retched into the toilet, though not much came up. He hadn't eaten since breakfast. Breakfast seems like year, years ago. Every, everything had still been normal at breakfast. Everything had been normal until he had brought Tagalong Freddy into the house. Back in the bedroom, Robert glared at the offending bear. He drew back his fist and punched it in the face again and again. It quickly became apparent that the punches weren't at all effective. The bear's face would cave in when Robert's fist made contact with it, but then it sprung back up into place. Robert wasn't doing it any harm, and the one thing he wanted other than getting Tyler back home safely was to harm the bear. Robert grabbed Tagalong Freddy by its ear and carried it downstairs. He went into the kitchen and retrieved the box of matches he kept on a high shelf in a cabinet out of Tyler's reach. He carried Freddy outside to the trash can and threw him back in. He struck a match and held it to the bear, waiting for it to catch fire. The bear's foot smouldered a little, but refused to burst into flames. It was probably treated with some chemical, Robert thought, to make it flame retardant. <laughs> Flame retardant. Okay, I'm going to go with flame retardant, yeah. A safety feature. Well, he put a stop to that. He grabbed the bottle of lighter fluid he kept near the grill. Robert doused the bear with lighter fluid. Then he struck another match and threw it into the garbage can. Tagalong Freddy went up in a satisfying whoosh of flames. Robert watched it burn for a few minutes, then used his garden hose to extinguish the fire. He didn't want to accidentally burn the whole house down. Once the fire died out, he felt a small amount of relief. He knew it wouldn't make any logical sense, but he still felt as if destroying the bear would somehow help find Tyler. At the very least, there wouldn't be a voice that kept telling Robert to kill himself. Now he could rest, just like the officer Ramirez had ordered him to. After he made sure the last of the fire was extinguished, he went back to his bedroom, undressed and crawled under the covers. He was pretty sure there was no way he was going to sleep, but it was a relief to lie down. He was so exhausted that every bone and muscle in his body felt heavy as lead. He didn't lose consciousness, but lay there in a sort of stupor, his eyes open, but not really seeing. The vibration of the tag-along time wristwatch startled Robert, but that was impossible. He had destroyed the bear. It couldn't send him messages anymore. Maybe he was asleep and it was a weird dream. Wouldn't it be wonderful if all of this had been a really bad dream? Robert slapped his own face and felt the sting. He wasn't dreaming. He lifted his arm and looked at the watch. A message from Freddy was flashing. With a shaking hand, he tapped the icon. Why don't you go to the cliffs? No, Robert yelled, clapping his hands over his ears. No, this is impossible. The bear is practically just ashes now. It's, it can't be still telling me to kill myself. It can't be telling me anything. Robert ran outside and lifted the lid out of the gar uh, and lifted the lid off the garbage can. The Freddy doll was charred, but it was still grinning. He reached inside the can and pulled it out. The bear stank of smoke and lighter fluid and was singed and blackened in some places, but it was still intact. Robert knew that he spent too much time without adult company since Anna, Anna died, and sometimes he felt so sad and lonely that he wondered if he should see a therapist. But now, it seemed. He had moved beyond the need to just talk to a caring professional. The trauma of losing Tyler after losing Anna had caused him to lose something else, his mind. But he, just be, but he had destroyed the bear. He knew what he had seen. When Robert had first seen the bear in the store, he thought it was cute, a nice, cuddly friend for his little boy. But now the bear's once charming smile looked malevolent. Its black eyebrows seemed to slant downward in a classic cartoon depiction of evil, it was all clear now. Robert had brought the bear into the house and Tyler had disappeared. Tyler's disappearance was the bear's fault. The bear could not continue to exist. I know what's going to happen, I think. I think I know what's going to happen. The bear could not continue to exist. Robert fished his car keys out of his pocket. He placed the bear in the driveway in the direct path of his car's left front tyre and then got into the car and started it. 
He only felt slight resistance as he drove over the bear, then put the car in reverse and backed over it. He then ran over it one last time, leaving the bear's body trapped beneath the tyre, a furry Freddy pancake. <laughs> Going back inside the house, he heard his phone ringing. How could he be so stupid as to leave his phone inside? This was the exact kind of stupidity that got Tyler kidnapped in the first place. He ran to answer it. Yes, he panted, out of breath. Mr. Stanton, this is Detective Maria... V ah, gosh. <laughs> Ramirez. Are you okay? It is such an absurd question that he almost laughed. Of course he wasn't okay. His child was missing and he just spent the past five minutes intentionally running over that child's favourite stuffed toy. These were not the actions of a person who was okay. He decided her question didn't deserve an answer. Instead, he asked the only question that mattered. Did you find him? Not yet, Mr. Stanton, but I wanted to let you know that the dog has his scent now and is searching for him. We also have the tag numbers of every white van in the metro area and we're running them to see if any of the owners have a history of criminal activity. We're working hard to find your boy. I call you in the morning and update you. Morning seemed like years away. How is he going to make it until morning without Tyler? Without even any information about Tyler? Is there something I should be doing? Stay close to the phone. Get some rest. Pray, if you're the praying sort. And stay hopeful. Thank you, Robert said. But really, other than destroying the bear, there was nothing he could do. He was a helpless, hopeless case. Just as he hung up the phone, his wristwatch vibrated. How? he yelled. How? He knew what it was going to say. And he and he was sorely tempted to run it over, just like the bear. But there was still a tiny chance, wasn't there? That the watch might have some connection to Tyler, that it might help him locate him in some way. He gritted his teeth and tapped a message from Freddy. Why don't you go to the cliffs? Broken, Robert sank to his knees and cried. The more the bear told him to go to the cliffs, the more suicide seemed like a welcome relief from his pain. Sure, it would be terrifying, standing on the edge, looking down at the jagged rocks below, and willing himself to jump. But the fall would be so fast, he wouldn't have time to think or feel anything, and the force with which he'd smash into the rocks would be so hard, he would die instantly. Even if there was some physical pain, it would still hurt less than the emotional pain that was ripping him apart. Without Anna and Tyler, what reason did he have to live? If he went to the cliffs, he could join Anna in death. Maybe there was even a possibility he would see her again on some other spiritual plane. And of course, it was possible that Tyler was also... This thought was so horrifying that it sent Robert running back to the bathroom to retch up the non-existent contents of his stomach. He leaned over the toilet, gagging and sobbing. My little boy, my little boy, were the words that played in a loop in his head. He flushed the toilet and stood up straight. He caught a glance at himself in the mirror and was shocked by what he saw. He seemed to have aged ten years in a single day. His complexion was grey and his eyes were swollen and bloodshot. His face was streaked with tears and snot. On impulse, he turned on the water in the shower. Maybe standing under the spray would calm him down a little, loosen the painful knots in his shoulders. He undressed and stepped into the stool. Letting the hot jets of water pound his neck and shoulders, he felt his exhausted mind begin to wander. Tyler's first birthday. Knowing the joy that one year old's taken destruction, Robert had gotten Tyler a special smash cake he could destroy in addition to a larger birthday cake that Robert would slice and serve. Tyler sat in his high chair, wearing a conical paper birthday hat. When the smash cake was set before him, he cackled with delight and immediately jammed both fists into it. He brought his fists down into the cake again and again, and then eventually gave one of his frosting covered hands an experimental lick. Apparently liking what he had discovered, he dove into the cake first, face first, coming up with a mouth and a face full of frosting. Robert had filmed the whole thing, laughing. Robert had been so happy that day. He had thought about how that day was the first of many happy, day, happy birthdays for his son. The first of many birthdays he and Tyler would celebrate together. He had been wrong. Freddy's words echoed in his head. Why don't you go to the cliffs? Two years before the birthday party. Robert and Anna's first anniversary. The official gift for his first wedding anniversary was supposed to be paper. Robert had checked out a book on origami from the library, and after a lot of failures and frustration, had learned how to make origami cranes. For weeks, he spent every spare minute he had folding pieces of paper into cranes. The night of their anniversary, they had gotten to their 
had, they have gone to their favourite sushi restaurant, and Robert had presented Anna with a box of 100 origami cranes. One crane, he said, for every year of happiness they would have together. Robert had known realistically that he and Anna couldn't possibly have 100 years together, but in his darkest nightmares, he never would have dreamed. Wait. Oh yeah, he never would have dreamed that they had only one year left. Were some people just doomed to lose everyone they loved? Or was it just Robert's own personal curse? Those words again. Why don't you go to the cliffs? Robert stood under the shower until the water ran cold and he started to shiver. He turned off the faucet and grabbed a towel. He dried himself off and put on his bathrobe, but he was still shaking, not just with the cold, but with sadness and fear. How could the bear still be threatening him? Hadn't he destroyed it? Robert remembered the line from the description on the toy's packaging. Tag along Freddy as the bear who is always there. Robert threw on an old t-shirt and a pair of shorts, then grabbed scissors from the bathroom cabinet. Oh god. He ran out of the house and into the driveway. He yanked the doll from under his car tyre, laid it flat on its back on the hood of the car and stabbed it over and over where his heart would be, if it had a heart. What do I have to do to make you go away? Robert yelled as he kept on stabbing the little bear. Why don't you just die? You're not even supposed to be alive. The bear's chest was stabbed to ribbons. Bits of stuffing poked out from between the tears. Robert was debating ripping out the stuffing when his wristwatch vibrated. He knew what to expect. He knew it would be awful. But the little flutter of hope from somewhere inside him whispered, What if? What if it's news about Tyler? What if I can save him? He took a deep breath and tapped a message from Freddy. Why don't you go to the cliffs? Why don't you go to the cliffs? Why don't you go to the cliffs? Why don't... Robert ripped off the watch and threw it against the pavement, smashing it. Finally, the watch was silent. He picked up the bear and looked in its blank, googly eyes. All of its rage, all of its pain had turned into a numbness that was somehow even worse. Fine, he said to the bear, feeling more emotionally drained than he ever felt. We'll go to the cliffs together. It's the only logical thing to do, Robert thought. See, I, I thought this would happen. I based, I think the cover kind of spoils it. <laughs> the cover of the book kind of spoils it because I feel like he's going to throw off um, the bear. And then, I don't know, maybe the bear will be revealed to actually contain the soul of um, Tyler. Wouldn't that be a massive reveal? Let's see. Let's see if that's true. I want to know if that's true. Robert was empty. He was a shell, like a house that had burnt so that all of its insides were destroyed. It might not look so bad from the outside, but really there was nothing left to save. It was time to bring in the wrecking ball. The final demolition was just a formality. He picked up the bear and went into the house. In the kitchen, he filled the cat's food bowl until it was overflowing and put out an extra bowl of water. That should hold Bart's... Uh, that should hold Bart until the police discovered Robert's body and came to search the house. Wait, what? No, no, he's not actually going to kill himself, is he? No, oh, surely not. The police could turn the cat over to the animal shelter and the shelter could find it a new home. It had never liked Robert anyway. Robert toyed briefly with the idea of leaving a note. But who would read it? Who would care? If he had anybody left to write a note to, he wouldn't be going to the cliffs in the first place. He grabbed the bear and walked out the front door, leaving it unlocked to make things easier for the police when they arrived to investigate. With Tagalong Freddy in hand, he walked toward the cliffs. The night sky was changing from black to an early morning grey. A neighbour whose name Robert couldn't remember was already up for his morning run. He slowed down when he saw Robert and started jogging in place. Any news about your son? The man asked. The neighbourhood's gossip machine was apparently working as effectively as usual. Robert couldn't bring himself to speak, so he just shook his head no. I'm sure he's fine, the man said, which Robert knew was a lie. How could this man be so sure when the police didn't even have any information? Let me know if you need anything. Robert knew the man went, meant well, but really, let me know if you need anything was an absurd thing to say to someone in Robert's situation. I need my son back, Robert thought. But since the universe is too cruel to let me have that, I need to jump off the cliffs. If you can't help me with either of those things, then you are no use to me. Goodbye. The man continued his run, and Robert started running in the opposite direction. But Robert wasn't moving like a man getting some exercise. He was running like a man pursued by demons. Oh god. He ran until he reached the cliffs. 
he made a beeline for the one everybody called Jumper's Cliffs, still holding his small stuffed enemy. When he stood at the summit and looked down at the rocky ground far below, it felt like his stomach dropped into his shoes. He had always been afraid of heights, but had con but has always considered it a sensible fear. It wasn't crazy to be afraid of something that could actually kill you. And now, even though death was his goal, he still felt afraid when he looked down. Robert held up the teddy bear and stared at it. This is what you want, right? He asked. Tears clouded Robert's eyes as he thought of Anna dying on the operating table during what should have been the happiest occasion of their life, the birth of their son. She never would have chosen to, take, to make such an early exit from life. She wouldn't have wanted Robert to make an early exit either, especially when, unlike her, he had a choice. The living Robert had been doing... The living Robert had been doing since Anna died... Oh, sorry. The living Robert had been doing since Anna died wasn't really living. Anna wouldn't have wanted that for him, either. She wouldn't have wanted him to shut out his friends and eat sad little sandwiches at his desk at work. She would have wanted him to go out with his co-workers and eat half-price sushi. She would have wanted him to enjoy fatherhood, but also enjoy the company of other grown-ups. Anna had loved life, and had loved Robert. She wouldn't have wanted him to give up on himself. And she wouldn't have wanted him to give up on Tyler, either. Not when there was, a, there, there was an even small chance that he might be alive. He thought of Tyler when he would stretch his arms up and say, Pick me up, Daddy. When he would giggle and say, Daddy, silly or when they would play Tickle Monster or the rhyming game or read books together. It was easy to get overwhelmed by the daily stresses of parenting, the effort of keeping a child clean and fed and cared for a day in and out, uh, for a day in and day out. It was undeniable the will of a toddler often posed a formidable challenge. But the truth was that most of the time he and Tyler spent together was great. He wouldn't trade over anything. If there was just one small chance, he could hear his little boy's voice again. Robert held up the dis despised bear and stared into its empty eyes. It drew back his arm and pitched the doll as hard as he could over the edge of the cliff. He spat over the ledge in defiance of what the evil toy had made had almost made him do. Of course, uh, sorry, of what he had almost let the toy made him do. Tyler wouldn't want me to. Robert screamed after the bear plummeted to the rocks below. His voice echoed, two, 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 in the canyon. Robert looked down at the rocks below, but also up at the sky where the dawn had turned the clouds a rosy pink, the colour of a dress Anna used to wear. He always told her that dress brought out the roses in her cheeks. Anna had wanted to live. Tyler, please let him still be alive, Robert thought, wanted to live. The two of them would want Robert to live too. Robert looked down at the rocky ground beneath him and then up at the pink clouds above him. Life was hard, but it could also be beautiful. The two people he loved most in the world wouldn't want him to lose sight of that. As the sun rose, Robert heard the early morning chirping of birds and the cry of some small animal he couldn't identify, the mewling of a kitten perhaps. The cries were coming from below him in one of the many holes that had created shallow miniature caverns in the rock face. The more Robert listened to the cries, he decided they sounded almost human. Could it be... Robert's heart felt as though it might pound right out of his chest. He made his way to the underside of the cliff. He had to resist the dangerous temptation to run. How embarrassing that would be if, he'd had, if he had decided to live and then fell off the cliff by accident. As he got closer to the caverns, the cries became more distinct. A high keening that would be a wounded animal, but also could be a frightened human child. Robert stood in front of the op openings in the rock face, hoping that he would see his son, and not a wounded animal that might attack him out of fear. Tyler, he yelled. Tyler, is that you? Daddy! Tyler's voice, weak from crying, came from the hole nearest Robert. Daddy! Daddy, come get me! The hole wasn't wide enough for Robert's shoulders to fit through. I can't fit in that hole, buddy. You're going to have to come to me. Come toward my voice, buddy. You can do it. He could hear scrabbling in the hole, and then, in what couldn't have been more than a minute, Tyler poked his head out of the rocky opening like some kind of woodland creature. He yowled out his arms, and Robert scooped him up and hugged him. Tyler was dirty and sweaty from his overnight stay in the cabins, but to Robert, he still smelled sweeter than anything else in the world. You scared me half to death, buddy, Robert said, 
holding Tyler close. Why in the world did you run off like that? I saw a doggy. Tyler said it like it was the most logical answer in the world. So you tried to follow the doggy and got lost. Uh Uh-huh. Tyler rested his head on Robert's shoulder. Well, that was really dangerous, buddy. You should never leave the yard unless I'm with you. Promise me you'll never do that again. Okay, daddy, Tyler said. Robert hoped he meant it. Good, let's go home. Yeah, carry me, Tyler said, and Robert could hear the tiredness in his voice. Okay, buddy. Robert was tired too, but now that he had found his son, he felt like he had the strength to carry him for a million miles. As Robert carefully walked away from Jumper's Cliff, Tyler said, Daddy? Yes, buddy? I'm thirsty. I bet you are. We'll get you a big cup of water as soon as we get home. And can I have peanut... Peanut nana? <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, but... oh, I don't know. I don't know what that... Is that butter? I don't know. And can I have peanut nana? Peanut banana? I don't know. <laughs> sure. Robert knew that the kid must be starving. He hadn't eaten since breakfast the day before. Robert was happy to have the opportunity to make Tyler his favourite snack again, sliced bananas with peanut butter, there we go, to dip them in. Toddlers like to eat things they could dip into other things. And I'll make my special mac and cheese for supper, okay? Yummy! Honestly, Robert's mac and cheese wasn't anything special, just a mix from a blue box. But it would be special because Tyler was back and unharmed and they'd be eating it together. From now on, all their time together would be special. A thought occurred to Robert as they reached the lower cliffs. Hang on just a second, buddy. I want to see something without getting too close up to the edge. Robert peered down in the direction in which he'd thrown Tagalong Freddy. The little bear was nowhere to be seen. What do you see, Daddy? Tyler asked. Nothing, buddy. But look how pretty the sky is. Your mum used to have a dress the colour of these clouds. He decided he would no longer keep silent about Anna. Tyler needed to hear about his mum, just as Robert needed to talk about her. If they talked about her, if they thought about her, there was a way in which she would still be with them. Mummy pretty, Tyler said. Yeah, she was, Robert said. Would you like to look at some pictures of your mummy sometime soon? Yeah, Tyler said. Tomorrow, Robert decided he would take out the photos of Anna from down, uh, down from the attic. He could put some on the mantle in the living room and maybe one in Tyler's room too. We'll do that tomorrow then, Robert said, and I can tell you some stories about her too. Your mummy was a very pretty and smart and nice person. (laughs) I don't know why I added person in there. Uh, Daddy's nice too, Tyler said. It it was a high compliment from a two-year-old. Thanks, buddy. I love you, Robert said, holding Tyler securely as he walked further and further away from the cliffs. I love you, Daddy. I love you too, buddy. Robert set Tyler down on the ground. Tyler slipped his hand into his daddy's and they walked together toward home. Interesting. <laughs> uh, that was a bit anticlimactic. I, I I feel like Scott could have gone so dark with that. Or even at the end there, maybe... Um, I don't know. I, I, that wasn't really... Yeah, it was very anticlimactic. I feel like there would there could have been a better ending to that. But I at the same time, um, it's good that he didn't commit suicide because Scott is, is uh, the writers are, are saying uh, displaying a good message, you know. Um, and I I think I feel like I should say this after I've read this. Um, suicide is very serious. It is never an option, uh, and if you need help um if you're struggling with things like depression and anxiety and serious things like that then there is always help for you um and suicide is never an option that anybody should take no matter what um because life is always worth living even even if you're down in the dumps life is always worth living because there's so many beautiful things in the world just like that story that i just read um so yeah, I did. I did find that story a little bit anticlimactic, unfortunately. Um, but I don't know. It was a good story, nevertheless. Um, as, as I as I just said. So yeah, uh, and I feel like Scott has saved up the dark stories for the next story that we're going to read, which is the Breaking Wheel, <laughs> which the title alone says it's going to be a pretty dark story. So if you are excited for that, uh, it will be coming very soon. 
hopefully um, on my channel. So make sure you subscribe so that you see when it comes out. Uh, and yeah, I hope you enjoyed. Uh, I certainly did. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next one.